Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Ben Struhl, and I'm working at the Dual Latif Jamil Poverty Action Hall, or JPAL. This is the fourth in a series of research webinars showcasing new evaluations by JPAL affiliated professors. In this and other webinars, we'll be discussing ongoing work, so the results here are full in the end. Today's webinar features Jens Ludwig, the McCormick Foundation Professor of Social Service Administration, Law, and Public Policy in the School of Social Service Administration in Chicago Harris. He's the director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and is an affiliated professor of JPAL. Jens's research interests explore topics such as urban poverty, crime, and education. Today, he will discuss recent research on the Becoming a Man, FAM, and MAPS style tutoring program. FAM was designed and implemented by a Chicago area nonprofit organization, Youth Guidance, to address high rates of violence among the youth. This is ongoing work with several co-authors, and if you'd like the full paper or slides from the presentation, please visit the event page on our website or send an email to webinar at povertyactionlab.org. Thank you again for joining us today, and without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you. The, uh, the city of Chicago, I'm mostly familiar with um, uh, social policy problems in the United States context. Um, one of the uh, major public policy problems that we've been struggling with here in the city of Chicago, where I live, is um, violence. We're not the most violent city in the United States on a homicides per capita basis, but the combination of our homicide rate and our the size of Chicago has given us the largest abs absolute amount of homicides in the United States on an annual basis, and that has wound up focusing a lot of media attention on this problem here. Um, so we've been motivated to spend a bunch of time here in Chicago trying to think about how to um, prevent crime and violence. Uh, it's not just a Chicago problem, though. It's not just a United States problem. Each year around the world, about a half a million people are uh, murdered. Um, that's about the, it's equivalent to the entire population of the city of Atlanta being um, killed every man, woman, and child year after year. Millions more people worldwide are the victims of other crime. Um, crime and violence, uh, as you might imagine, are enormously regressive in their impact. Um, rates of violence are much higher in developing countries on average than in developed countries and within developed countries like the United States much higher in um, uh, economically and racially segregated neighborhoods than in, um, uh, in other parts of town. Um, these are problems also that have been um, very persistent. So I, you know, we've, in doing this work, we've really uh, sort of focused on uh, what we think of as two flip sides of the same coin, which is um, school failure in the U.S. The version of that that we focus most on is high school dropout. Um, you can see that we, in the United, this is the uh, overall uh, high school graduation rate in the United States over time, going back to 1950. And up through about the late 60s, early 70s, we've been making very good progress in increasing high school graduation rates, but it's been uh, remarkably flat over the, uh, over the 40 years or something since then, at a time when the importance of having a high school diploma for your long-term labor market outcomes has just increased dramatically. The picture is not so different, unfortunately, in the case of um, interpersonal violence. I, which, you know, I think the thing that has gotten so much um, media attention in the U.S. context um, is the um, time series variation in the homicide rate. That is, you can see when you look at the homicide rate per 100,000 people in America as a whole, there's a lot of squiggles over time. So the rate goes up a lot in the 60s for reasons no one understands. It squiggles around. It's declined a lot in the 1990s. I think the important point that I want you to take from this graph, though, is that the homicide rate that we have in the United States right now is um, not really all that different from the homicide rate per 100,000 that uh, we had in uh, 1950. And this is, um, uh, this is really quite remarkable when you contrast uh, mortality rates from interpersonal violence with mortality rates that you see from other leading causes of death. So if you look at U.S. data, going back to 1950, the 
uh, mortality rates per, per capita for almost every leading major cause of death have absolutely plummeted, um, with two exceptions. One is cancer and the other is, uh, is homicide. Now, um, when you, normally when we see a big, uh, social problem like this, um, we, and that's been so persistent over such long periods of time, it's an, a natural conclusion that we have is to think that this is a problem that must be really hard to solve. Um, other times big problems persist over time because we've been focused on doing the wrong things. And so what I want to argue over the next few minutes is that some of the research that we've been doing here in Chicago suggests that um, it might be possible to make a surprisingly large amount of progress on the crime problem just by um, teaching people to do something as simple as stop, look, and listen before they act. So you might think it's a totally crazy idea, but hopefully um, by the end of the uh, slideshow, uh, I will have brought you around to the idea that there might be something really to this. Um, I want to start off, since many of you are probably not, um, probably not experts on crime and violence uh, in your research lives, you might have an image of violence in the U.S. context that comes from something like watching The Wire. You see Snoop Pearson and Chris Paltrow going out to do a drug hit on uh, Avon Barksdale's uh, drug gang on behalf of Marla Stansfeld. It's uh, it's motivated by some rationale to further the uh, uh, goal of some drug selling organization, and it's premeditated. So in the wire, Snoop and Chris actually pack up their black SUV with construction equipment so that they can dispose of uh, dead bodies in abandoned warehouses in Baltimore. Um, I want to. Um, reorient your image of what the violence problem, at least in the U.S. context, really looks like. And so I wanted to just very quickly talk you through an example that happened uh, last summer. This is a more or less randomly selected example from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, this happened on a Saturday, June 2nd, um, 2012, in the South Shore neighborhood, which is about three miles where I am right now, uh, three miles southwest, or southeast, rather, of where I am here at the University of Chicago in my office. So it's three in the afternoon on a Saturday and two groups of kids are uh, in the middle of the street at 73rd and Cole Avenue, uh, woofing at each other about uh, whether a kid in one group stole a bike from a kid in one of the other groups. The two groups start to separate in the middle of the street, so self-defense is not a rationale for what happens next, um, which is that a kid in one of the group pulls out a uh, 38 semi-automatic handgun and fires into the other group and hits a 16-year-old uh, named Jamal Lockett in the chest. Emergency medicine, uh, the EMS comes and they race him down Lakeshore Drive, downtown to Streeterville to Northwestern Memorial Hospital to the ER where the kid is pronounced dead. Uh, two weeks later, the Cook County State's Attorney charges the shooter, the alleged shooter with first degree murder, uh, Calvin Carter, there's a picture here, a 17-year-old kid from the far south side. side. Um, so this is not an unusual case, um, an unusual case at all. Um, if you look at Chicago Police Department data, 70% uh, of the homicides that happen in Chicago, the police attribute to an altercation. Um, and a lot, of, many of those have the same flavor of the one that I just described. There, it's an argument uh, basically over nothing, so it's almost Seinfeldian in its genesis. Um, that turns into a tragedy because uh, someone's got a gun ready at hand and, um, uh, and, and uses it, and it results in a tragedy. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking about policy responses to address this problem, uh, you have to think about what might be driving the violence in order to think about what a reasonable uh, and a promising intervention might be, and so why do we have violent events like this in the U.S. and not just in the U.S.? Um, one answer that you hear a lot is poverty. People are poor. And so, uh, you know, different versions of this that you will uh, read in the academic literature and the news articles go something like um, people are poor, so the benefits of getting a stolen bike are very, uh, loom very large. Maybe the costs of being, um, put into prison if you think that your lifetime labor market prospects 
loom less large, this would be sort of a standard kind of Gary Becker way to think about this in, um, in an economics context. A different sort of argument that you hear over and over again, uh, uh, certainly in the mass media, for why we have violent events like this, is that families and neighborhoods are not doing a good job of socializing kids. And so, you know, maybe the most um, famous articulation of this in the U.S. setting was by uh, John Giulio, who's a political science professor at the University of Pennsylvania now, who wrote an art, a very influential article in the Weekly Standard in the 1990s talking about the development of a new generation of super predators who were uh, being inadequately socialized by their communities and suffered from what he called moral poverty. So Julia defines moral poverty as the poverty of growing up surrounded by deviant, delinquent, criminal adults in abusive, violence-ridden, fatherless, godless, jobless settings. Whatever their material circumstances, Julia argues, kids of whatever race, creed, or color are most likely to become criminally depraved when they're morally deprived. Um, now, both of those arguments, so I think it's worth sort of pausing for a moment and reflecting on both of those arguments. Um, both of those arguments, uh, poverty and moral poverty, are, are root cause arguments uh, that have sort of the following flavor. There is a root cause in the background that is causing people to engage in crime and violence. Um, those root causes uh, tend to be very difficult to change. And so I think one logical implication of a uh, root cause sort of explanation for violence is if people are engaging in violence because of this root cause, that root cause is hard to change. Absent some change in, in that root cause in the background, people are going to continue to engage in crime and violence over and over again because the thing that's causing them to do it is, uh, is still there. And so that leads to a prediction, those theories lead to a prediction that the people who are engaged in crime are very committed to the activity. Um, it's not surprising that lots of people have come to adopt this view of criminal behavior because, you know, at least in the U.S. context, when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, data from, say, the state prison system around the country, only two-thirds of people who are released from state prisons in the U.S will be rearrested again within three years. So of course you're gonna think that the people who are engaging in crime are um, committed criminals when you see the same people getting arrested over and over and over again. Um, so uh, when I do this in person, and I should, this is a slide of Lindsay Lowen, in case we have uh, a webinar attendees from around the country. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I have no idea whether uh, this Lindsay Lowen joke is going over well or not on a webinar setting, but um, I think the, the thing that I want to pivot to now is, well, okay, so let me, uh, let me say one other thing before I turn to our theory, which is um, from a policy perspective now, um, what would you do if you're a policymaker and you believe that the people who are engaging in crime are uh, strongly committed to criminal activity uh, and hard to push off that behavioral trajectory because the root causes that are driving them to engage in crime are to change. Well, you know, you might think that the only thing that you could do as a policymaker to respond is lock people up. And that is something that, for better or worse, the United States has been remarkably good at doing since the 1970s. And so this is a graph showing the incarceration rate for 100,000 people in America going back to the 1930s. And what you can see is um, for most of the 20th century in the United States, the U.S. imprisonment rate um, fluctuated around 100 per 100,000. And then starting in the late 1970s, uh, there was just a dramatic change in the policy response. Many people think that this was driven by, um, uh, exclusively driven by the war on drugs, but only about a third of this increase is actually driven by increased incarceration for drug offenses. Uh, the remainder, we've been doing a very good job of putting more and more people in prison for longer and longer periods of time for a wide range of offenses. Now, what I want to do is I want to um, just talk you through the alternative theory of crime that motivates a lot of the work that we've been doing in Chicago recently. And I think it's um, most, I think it's easiest to convey the logic behind our theory 
through a little uh, through a little game, um, which I uh, I hope you will do in your office as you're watching this web webinar. I have to when I do this in person, I can see if people are actually complying or not on a webinar. I have uh, a difficult time monitoring compliance, but um, let me trust you all to uh, to do this. Um, and here's what I'm hoping that you'll do. Uh, I'm going to show you a slide with an object in the middle of it, and I want you to call out uh, in your office to yourself the color of the uh, the object in the middle. Uh, and so we'll do an easy one. All right, so the instructions are pretty straightforward. Let's do an easy one to get started. So you should say black. I'm going to go uh, very quickly through the rest of these, and so I'm going to trust that you're complying as we go through these. Okay, so ready? We'll go very quick. Now, um, if you are actually complying and doing that in your office, um, what most of you will have done uh, by the time we got to this last slide is you would have said blue instead of orange, even though my instructions were to call out the color in the, um, the color of the object rather than um, the shape of the object or, or what the, uh, you know. And so why did you, um, why did you call out blue. Um, here's what I think is going on here. Um, you know, if you've read Danny Kahneman's terrific book, Thinking Fast and Slow, you will recognize that there's a growing body of research in psychology that suggests that all of us basically outsource a lot of our daily behavior to what Kahneman calls system one, or th that is our automatic systems. Because actually thinking about what we're doing is uh, effortful and costly, and so we try and economize on that. Um, and uh, so the sort of automatic systems that we develop uh, tend to be tuned to be adaptive to our daily environments. And so all of you have developed an automatic response that says, when I see a word, I automatically read it. Um, and that's hugely adaptive for most of you uh, in most of your daily settings. But you can see in this application that I just talked you through, that automatic response that normally helps you turns out to be very unhelpful. Um, it gets you into trouble. In, in this particular case, it gets you into only the most mild form of trouble. If, you know, we're in a group setting instead of a webinar, the trouble consists of you're being embarrassed um, for having said blue instead of orange. Um, in a webinar setting where it's just you in your office, uh, the, the trouble is attenuated further. Now let's, but let's take that logic to the south side of Chicago. Uh, if you're a kid growing up on the south side of Chicago, um, it is probably hugely adaptive for you to develop an automatic response that says, I can't let people think I'm a pushover. Now, that sort of automatic response probably serves you very well in your, uh, in your daily life most of the time, but can lead to tragedy when you've got a 38 uh, semi-automatic in your waistband. Uh, and so that gives us one hypothesis that gives us one hypothesis for what might have happened on June 2nd, 2012 in, um, uh, in the South Shore neighborhood of Chicago. But that's just a hypothesis. Um, and I think, you know, for me, one of the big problems of, of the whole field of criminology and one of the reasons that I'm um, very excited to be part of JPAL uh, and very excited to see JPAL uh, develop a North America office as well is, um, you know, I think there are lots of hypotheses about what to do about the crime problem and uh, not very good um, empirical evidence about which of these hypotheses actually have anything behind them. And so uh, what we've been doing in Chicago is carrying out uh, randomized trials of this intervention called Becoming a Man, as I mentioned in the beginning, that was developed by Youth Guidance and World Sports Chicago. Um, I think I'm happy to talk more about what the intervention looks like during the Q&A session, but I just want to say a couple things about the intervention for starters for now. Uh, one thing that I want to say is it is a relatively light touch intervention. So uh, the way we did it in the 2009-2010 uh, academic year, we offered kids the chance to participate for a year for weekly in-school sessions. They could go for an hour a week uh, to some group program that had about 10 to 15 kids in a group. Um, 
And, you know, the basic focus of the program, I think, is essentially to stop, look, and listen before. So getting kids to slow down and think about what they're doing in high-stakes settings where their automatic responses might get them into trouble. The average participant attended just about half of those sessions. So the number of contact hours here is not very great. The cost as it was done in 2009-2010, as I said, is a little over uh, maybe $1,200 per, per participant. Um, and, you know, you might be thinking, um, surely there's no way, surely there's no way that such a light touch intervention could have any sort of detectable effect on violent behavior in an environment in which we've made such a, lot, a little long-term progress. And so um, to describe the results of the, uh, the first crime lab project that we did, I want to turn it over to our crime lab spokesperson. Let me see if we worked on the, on the webinar now. Oh, okay, so I can see that. Um, let's see if, uh, here we go. For those of you who are not in the U.S. context, that was uh, uh, current Chicago Mayor Ron Emanuel, who um, had previously been chief of staff to President Obama. And the results that he's announcing at Harper High School, that was a news conference at Harper High School in the Englewood neighborhood in the south side of Chicago. One year of this becoming a man intervention reduced um, uh, violent crime arrest rates to participants by 44% and increased expected high school graduation rates by 10 to 20%. Um, we estimate that the uh, ratio of benefits to society to program costs might be as high as, uh, as 30 to 1. The intervention is not very expensive, and the social harm from violence in the U.S. context is, uh, is enormous. Um, I think there's a um, a second lesson to that um, to that slot, uh, to that little video clip there, which is uh, JPAL has been, um, I think, enormously influential through its policy experimentation in the developing country context. And so, I think one question that you might have as JPAL pivots now to do more work in North America is whether the same. Now, there's an implicit theory of social change here, which says let's do uh, rigorous social experiments on promising interventions and then hope that uh, the public sector adopts promising technologies and scales them up. And I think one encouraging thing about this initial work we've been doing in Chicago is illustrated by that video clip, is that that implicit theory of social change might, might hold in North America, not just in the developing country context as well. So this is uh, Mayor Emanuel saying, uh, the other part of the clip was Mayor Emanuel saying, uh, he's sufficiently convinced by the randomized trial evidence that our uh, University of Chicago Crown Law Center did that he's going to start putting city money into the intervention to scale it up. And um, some of you might remember shortly after President Obama was inaugurated for a second term in office, uh, two weeks after that, Hadia Pendleton, a high school kid who had performed at the inauguration, was shot and killed about a mile north of where I am at, uh, at the University of Chicago. So President Obama comes to Chicago a couple of weeks after that um, to give a speech on gun violence at Hyde Park High, which is right around the corner from the University of Chicago. And City Hall here in Chicago says, one of the things, Mr. President, that you should do while you're here is go sit in on one of these program sessions of uh, becoming a man. So you're the president at one of these sessions. They'd slaughtered him for 15 minutes to spend with the kids. He spent an hour and 45 minutes with the kids. They'd been to the White House a couple of times to visit the president since then. Um, and we were at the White House in early April talking to a bunch of federal agencies about the uh, possibility of thinking about what it would look like to uh, learn about how to reverse engineer what is making BAM work and, um, and take that to scale. And so I think it, sort of one more data point to suggest that um, this sort of uh, rigorous social experimentation in the U.S. context uh, might uh, be able to have the same sort of influence that j experiments have had in the developing country context. All right, so 
I want to just say maybe one or two other things, and then I'll stop and take questions. Um, one thing that you might, um, one thing that you might be thinking, because I suspect that this is, I don't know exactly who's on the webinar, but I suspect that it's probably a, a fairly sophisticated audience. Um, one thing that you might be thinking is, um, well, you know, maybe these nerds at the University of Chicago just got lucky. Uh, they did an experiment and um, they found some encouraging evidence and we're not hearing from the 19 other nerds around the country who did some experiment of some youth violence program that didn't have a statistically significant impact and so we're just looking at the guy who got lucky. Um, and so I wanted to just spend a minute talking about a follow-up experiment that we did. So we, you know, as economists, we were very surprised that this, um, you know, you could think about this as basically a behavioral economics oriented intervention to reduce automaticity. We were surprised that a light touch intervention could generate such a large behavioral response. And so we have been doing follow-up experiments to see if they're really, if this could be real. And so one of the follow-up experiments that we did was, um, in the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. So this is a picture of that facility. It's located on the west side of Chicago. This is a facility where the highest risk juvenile arrestees are uh, taken um, after they're arrested. So the, the average offense severity of these kids is much, much higher than, the juvenile system is much more selective in terms of who it detains before their uh, cases are adjudicated compared to the adult system. So the average kid year is going to be a much more serious offender than what you would see, for instance, if you went to the Cook County uh, adult jail. Um, and this is the largest single juvenile temporary uh, detention facility in the United States. It has 500 beds. It has historically been uh, something of a mess. Uh, many years ago, a juvenile, it was such a mess, a, juvenile, a, a federal judge came in and took the facility over and asked a um, uh, well-regarded national uh, expert, a guy named Earl Dunlap, to take it over. And the first thing that Earl did is he said, um, this is Earl talking now, he said, you can't possibly hope to run a 500-bed facility in, um, in any sort of reasonable way. So he says, what I'm going to do, step one, is basically divide this place up in its operations into 10 50-bed facilities, and I'm going to try and get my hands around each one of these 50-bed facilities one at a time. And one of the things that he does is he um, starts to reform the facility where, uh, you know, as a way to control the kids' behavior day by day, he implements um, a little token economy system where when the kids are good, they get points. When the kids are bad, they lose points. And there's, um, as points uh, accumulated above some threshold will get you some reward in the facility, or, you know, an extra snack on movie night or extra time in the gym. But the other thing that he does um, in these facilities, as uh, these 50 bed units as he's reforming them, is that the kids go to school in the morning and in the afternoon they used to just sit around watching TV or playing cards. And Earl says, why don't we try and use that um, uh, that afternoon time in a more developmentally productive way for kids and have them engage in uh, some programming uh, oriented basically around stop, look, and listen. So it is a different version of stop, look, and listen from what I described previously. Um, totally different curriculum, not delivered by a nonprofit that's hired professionals to do it. So Earl Dunlap, when he's doing in this in, in detention facility, he doesn't have a lot of extra money to um, uh, to uh, spend on programming so he has his detention staff trained up to do this. And so Earl is doing this one 50-bed unit at a time. He gets about halfway through his reforming when uh, the union in, um, in Cook County files a lawsuit saying this sort of programming is not part of our union contract. This is not in our job description. Um, a judge freezes in place Earl's reforms, and so there's about a, you know, a 14 or 16 month period where uh, half the 50 bed units in the JTDC are doing the, the new style stuff, which includes stop, look, and listen, and half are doing the old style stuff. We go to Earl and we say, do you have any, what, what is your uh, process for deciding which kids will go into which 
which 50 bed unit? And he says, well, it's basically arbitrary. And we say, well, Earl, if it's basically arbitrary, why not take that next step of making making it officially random so we can learn something for whether these reforms about whether these reforms are actually as helpful as we hope. And so Earl says yes, and we work with them to randomize these kids as they're coming in. They're getting something like 4,000 different kid spells a year passing through the facility, so it's a pretty sizable, uh, pretty sizable sample size. And this is what you see when you compare. So the, the red bar here is the return rate. Um, so the, on the x-axis here is we have months from uh, release from the JTDC for each kid who's entering and exiting facility. And the y-axis here is the share of those kids who come back to the JTDC within a defined time period. The red bar here is the return rate for the kids who are randomly assigned to one of these stop look and listen units within the facility. And so one of the things that you can see here is that more than half the kids are coming back by 14 months. And so when we go to the facility and we're interviewing the staff who are delivering the stop look and listen programming, you know, what they'll say is it's not clear to us that this programming is having much, much effect. And you're not surprised that their eyeball estimate is skeptical that this does much good because they're seeing more than half of the kids they're working with come back. But your eyeball estimate when you're a staff member in the facility can't tell you is that the return rate is higher for the kids who are randomly assigned to the status quo services. That's the blue bar here. And so that's a 15% uh, reduction from the stop, look, and listen intervention. Um, and you might say, well, how do I think about whether a 15% reduction is a big deal or a small deal? And as an economist, I would say one way to think about that is um, what does it cost me to get that 15% reduction and what is a 15% reduction worth to society? This is a dirt cheap intervention because you've got the staff, you've got the kids, you've got the building. All you have to do is train the staff up and think out some stuff, look and listen books. And um, the value to society uh, of this reduction in criminal behavior is very high. And so I think this looks like a very uh, a very promising um, element of a, a strategy that you might um, that you might roll out so I think one I think there's one thing that's um, so one thing that's encouraging about this is that we do another trial and we again find encouraging results and that makes you think that the first trial um, is less likely to be a fluke I think the other thing that's exciting about this is one of the big challenges in social policy is thinking about taking interventions to scale and the fact that we see encouraging results from a totally different curriculum here, uh, a, a totally different stop, look, and listen curriculum delivered by a totally different type of program provider makes you think that it's the underlying program logic that might matter here rather than any particular feature of the Becoming a Man program that might be hard to, to take to scale. So I think this, um, you know, this work has uh, really changed my view of what might be driving the crime and violence problem. And I think that that, um, that view was very nicely crystallized when Anud Shah and Sendhil Malinathan and I were in the Juvenile Detention Center. And we were talking to one of the, um, the, the team leaders there where he said, you know, um, uh, he said, this is the team leader now talking to us. He said, 20% of the kids in here have some, some severe problem. Uh, they're just criminals. If you let them out, they're going to do bad things to, that, to other people, and you just need to keep them detained for, for public safety reasons. But this is the staff leader talking, and the staff leader says to us, um, but the other 80%, I always tell them, uh, if I could give you back just 10 minutes of your lives, none of you would be here. Um, and I think that is a very, uh, that is a very profound insight into what might be driving, uh, not all, but at least uh, an important part of the violence in the U.S. context, and I suspect not just in the U.S. context. Um, that's not going to be a silver bullet, so to speak, for the violence problem. Um, but I think that this sort of approach can be, uh, uh, can be a very kind of cost-effective element for a larger portfolio of interventions that you might think about rolling out to try and make some uh, some progress on this problem. Um, so let me um, let me stop there. Uh, I think we have about 25-ish uh, minutes.
for Ben to read uh, any questions that have been uh, emailed in. Uh, so my first question for you, Yen, is about um, your efforts in Chicago now are focused on both uh, becoming a man and math style tutoring for students. Uh, can you sort of talk about how those two programs are different and how you see them working together and how you see them being rolled out uh, in the future? Yeah, that's great. So, um, you know, one of the things that we saw in the, um, we've done a couple different trials of becoming a man now in Chicago, and one of the things that we've seen in those, um, those trials is um, that Becoming a man on its own seemed to uh, be helpful in getting the kids to um, uh, re-engage with school. So they come to school more often. They seem to actually try in their classes. So the number of Fs that the kids are getting uh, declined. Um, but we, uh, you know, you're not. You're, we're mostly seeing uh, great changes on the sort of F to D margin. You know, we're not. It, it, it almost feels like there's a, a little bit of a feeling on how, how well the kids are doing in school. And we went around to try and think about what was going on. We went around to the different south and west side schools that we've been working in. And one of the things that you can see um, when you're in the schools is that uh, you, know, you can see ninth and 10th grade kids in the Chicago public school system who are literally struggling to do third and fourth grade math problems, like what is eight by seven, what is 17 by 10. And uh, at the same time, the ninth and 10th grade math teachers, given the way these school systems are designed, are they're having their feet held to the fire to deliver ninth and 10th grade math content. And uh, you know, most of the education reforms that uh, we talk about, at least in the US context, tend to be focused on increasing the quality with which the ninth and 10th grade math teacher are delivering ninth and 10th grade math content. But, you know, if your kid is struggling with third grade math, having the teacher say it louder is only going to be so helpful. And so what we um, uh, thought might need to happen in order to fully, the, the, the BAM sort of primes the kids to re-engage with school, but then there's this mismatch between, we were worried that there was this mismatch between where the kids' needs are academically and what the classroom environment is actually delivering and thought um, what these kids really need, uh, might really need, is something that is um, very individualized so they can actually uh, have some traction with it. The other thing that we thought is whatever they're going to get needs to be very intensive because for, you know, a ninth grade kid is struggling with third grade math, we know in Chicago that um, Ninth grade required core math class is, you know, one of the biggest gate, uh, gatekeepers for whether you get a high school diploma or not. And, um, you know, if, the, if these kids can't engage with grade level uh, math instruction, they're going to have very little hope for getting a diploma and just totally disengage. And so what we need to do is to figure, figure out a way to have something that's not just individualized but very intensive and get them back up to or at least close to grade level so they can get something from a regular high school diploma and have hope of getting a, a sorry, re-engage with a regular high school classroom environment so they have hope for getting a diploma. Um, and so then we started to look around the uh, research literature and think about what a best practice kind of intervention like that would look like. And we saw Roland Fryer's uh, very interesting paper where he goes to Houston Public Schools and he gets a bunch of public schools there to adopt what he thinks are the five most promising active ingredients of what high-performing charter schools do. And my reading of that paper was that it certainly looked like one of the most promising ingredients was um, this sort of uh, match education, uh, high dosage, very individualized math tutoring. And so Roland's paper wasn't an experiment, but you know he did, uh, I think, the very best job that you could imagine doing analyzing the data, given that it wasn't an experiment, but the results certainly were very suggestive and promising. And so Roland is now part of our research team here. We've taken MATCH into Chicago, and we have a large-scale experiment uh, underway that basically has a two-by-two -two design where some kids are randomly assigned to get just BAM, some kids are randomly assigned to get just MATCH high-dosage tutoring, and some kids are randomly assigned to get both, and some kids 
a randomly signed you get none. And so that project is supported by Gate Out North America, among other sources. And I think that's going to let us answer a couple different questions, including the degree to which sort of best practice academic and non-academic intervention might have uh, synergistic or more than additive uh, effect beyond giving kids uh, one or the other alone. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from Aaron, uh, who wants to know about uh, a detail about the intervention that you mentioned that participants only attended about half of the session. Have you learned anything about how variance in how many sessions uh, that the participants attended affects the outcome? So is there a particular dosage effect, maybe? Um, and uh, was there any effort to incentivize people for attending more sessions? Yeah, that's a great um, that's a great question. So I think um, uh, you know we've we've done a, a version of what Jeff Kling, Larry Katz, and Jeff Liebman did in their 2007 kind of metric paper with the moving opportunity data, where you know they moving opportunity has is a residential mobility experiment where there are five cities and within each city people are randomized to treatment and control, and they basically uh, have this instrumental variable set up where you can in some of the cities, treatment assignment winds up uh, uh, generating a bigger treatment dosage than in other cities. And so you can use that variation to see if there's sort of a dose-response relationship, and you can even try and do that to see if there's maybe a nonlinear uh, dose-response relationship. So we tried to do something like that in our application as well, since we did the very first STEM experiment in 15 different schools. Uh, there certainly seems to be a dose-response relationship with only 15 different school sites, though, we don't have a lot of power to tell whether there's a nonlinear dose response relationship, so that whether there's sort of a threshold effect. Uh, so we don't know that right now. I think one of the things that the, that youth guidance, the nonprofit that developed them, learned from that first experiment is the importance of trying to incentivize kids. And so I think that they've been modifying the program as they're going to think about different things, including what sorts of incentives might want to, uh, they might want to do to bring the kids in. I think they're very sensitive to the possibility that extrinsic incentives might crowd out intrinsic motivation. Um, and so I think they don't want to, they don't want to make the incentive structure too, too generous, but I think they've definitely been focused on increasing the, the pickup. Uh, take up rates and we'll see what we get at the end of this academic year when we look at the large scale experimental data. Great. Um, we have a question from Emmanuel, who is uh, actually a JPAL researcher in Africa in Cape Town. Uh, and he notes that South Africa, notably Cape Town, has a large gang violence problem and a number of similarities with the context of your study. He wants to know if you've considered testing or replicating the evaluation in either a different region of the U.S. or a different country. Yeah, so we've been um, we've been talking to the U.S. federal government about the possibility of taking it in the different cities um, uh, here to learn more about the degree to which you know this intervention that we've tested several times in Chicago now might export to other at least U.S. contexts. I have been a little bit um, risk averse in thinking about taking this to uh, other contexts, um, you know, primarily because, uh, you know, I've not done a lot of international work myself yet, and I um, uh, have, I think what I would like to know is whether, the very least, whether it exports to other U.S. contexts before we think whether, about whether we can export it to other international contexts. Partly because uh, it feels that at least some of you, if you look around the world, at least some of the really dangerous countries, like places like El Salvador, it, uh, I worry that the, the nature of the gang violence problem in places like that um, could be uh, different in important ways from what we have even here on the south side of Chicago that might change the effectiveness of the intervention. I think. Um, Anuj Shah and Sina Malanisan and I are working hard right now to try and reverse engineer what it might be about them that's making it work. And maybe as we learn more about that and as we can identify some international context that might feel more similar-ish to what we have here in the U.S., maybe something like South Africa, um, that would definitely be something that I would like to, um, to explore at some point down the road. Great. Thanks. 
Uh, we have a question here from Noor. Uh, she wants to know, what is the scope to integrate parents and caretakers into this type of program? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, psychologists, uh, when I talk to my psychology friends, they have initially a very skeptical reaction of this program because uh, the BAM counselors don't spend a huge amount of time going out and trying to change the families in which these kids are, are living. And the psychologists say, in order to have really big behavior change, you need to change what's going on in the home. And um, what I'm for sure willing to believe is that a program that changes families rather than just working with kids is going to have bigger impact. But what for sure is also true is that programs that try and work with families and change what's going on with the families are going to be much more expensive than the programs that just work with kids. Right, so um, uh, I think what remains very much an open question is whether a variant of this that um, that is much more family focused would be more or less cost effective than something that just works with kids in groups in school or in a detention center setting. Psychologists have been studying different interventions that work with families, things like multi-systemic therapy or functional family therapy. Um, the psychology uh, research, the way that psychologists do these studies often makes it difficult to figure out what the costs of the programs are and what, uh, you know, what, what exactly the, the impacts are in some unit that you can compare to different studies. And so we're trying to figure out what, the, what that sort of cost effectiveness comparison is across the different interventions. Um, I think that remains very much a, a critical policy question that, that we have not nailed down yet. Um, great. We have a question from uh, John who asks, uh, have you come across similar programs that have been tried historically that have not been effective? Yeah, there is um, the, the, the stop, look, and listen intervention that I described. It's a version of what psychologists call cognitive, uh, call cognitive behavioral therapy, which was developed uh, initially um, in the 1960s to address different sort of mental health problems. Um, you know, and has been found to be effective with things like depression and anxiety disorder and stuff like that. So rather than like Woody Allen therapy where you're on the couch for 20 years, um, this is very time limited and very focused on these sort of maladaptive automatic responses that can get, uh, you know, in that case, keep people in the cycle of depression or anxiety or whatever it is and how do you break out of that. Um, there, over time, uh, the encouraging results that we've seen for mental health problems led researchers to start to wonder if this would work for other sorts of behaviors as well. And so there's a little bit of there are some studies uh, like that. Um, most of them are not experimental. There's a small number of experimental tests in CDC that tend not to be great. And so uh, the findings of the experiments of CBT of Stop, Look, and Listen, those results are mixed. Uh, but when you look at the individual experimental studies, sometimes you can see that randomization was not done correctly. So it will be like 60% of the treatment group is African American and 30% of the control group is African American. Or they'll say we didn't find any statistically significant effects. The program didn't work, but then it was like 100 kids randomized to treatment, 100 kids randomized to control, and not followed for a very long period of time. So the standard errors are enormous, and you don't have much statistical power to figure out what in the world is going on. And so um, I. Uh, I think we are not at a state in this in this literature yet to be able to say much of anything about whether different variants of this intervention, whether we can learn anything from variation across program flavors about what the ingredients are, but clearly that sort of reverse engineering has got to be one of the top priorities moving forward so that you can really export it and scale it up. Great. We have time for just one more quick question uh, from Anna, who asks uh, about you mentioned that uh, Mayor Emanuel was uh, convinced by the evidence you brought to him and decided to scale this up. Uh, do you think that other policymakers are uh, convinced by this evidence in a similar way, or is this, do you think, uh, uh, an unusual situation? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, that, uh, the people, uh, at the White House, um, were convinced, and so that's, you know, that's encouraging as well. And we've been getting a lot of calls from cities across the country in the U.S. and, and different cities, uh, around the world, um, asking us to talk more through the results and what the nature of the intervention is and, and whether they might be able to, to try this in their, in their city. And I, I think, you know, one interpretation of that is, I, I think there are two interpretations of that. One interpretation of that is that there really is a recognition by policymakers um, across the country and around the world uh, about the limited, their limited understanding at this point about what the most effective uh, policy responses are to this incredibly, uh, incredibly damaging social problem. And I think that there is a real uh, Appetite in many, many cities, certainly not all cities, but I think that there's a, a big appetite in many cities across, you know, even a, a very developed country like the U.S. for, um, for the sort of evidence-based, uh, evidence-based policy. And so I'm, you know, at least right now, I'm feeling very, uh, very bullish on the, the prospects of J-PAL North America to, to make a difference. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Unfortunately, though, that's all the time we have. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, really give a special thanks to Jens for uh, taking the time to share his research with us today, uh, and to all of you uh, listeners for joining us and sending in your questions. Uh, we really appreciate the engagement around this really important issue. Uh, we'll be posting the video from today on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. If you have feedback on the webinar, we'd love to hear it. You can share it via email at webinar at povertyactionlab.org. To hear about our upcoming research webinars and other news from JPAL, we encourage you to visit our website and follow us, uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, uh, you know, it's always wonderful to follow the University of Chicago Crime Lab and the work Jens is doing with them as well. Uh, so uh, thanks so much again and hope everyone has a great day.